Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, I'm continuing today in the study of the book of Ecclesiastes. And I'm going to pick up where I left off last time, beginning in chapter 7, verse 1. If you have not seen the previous studies on Ecclesiastes, uh, they're all uploaded and available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. So I hope you will go back and watch this from the beginning. Now, uh, I am a KJV firstist. So I will read it first in the KJV, but sometimes I look at it in the Amplified Translation. Sometimes that, that is helpful to me. So let's begin. A good name is better than precious ointment and the day of death than the day of one's birth. Hmm, that's interesting. I don't recall ever hearing that. Of course, I've read Ecclesiastes. I've read the entire Bible numerous times, but this stands out to me as uh, I, I seem like a, a very memorable statement. A good name is better than precious ointment, okay? Anybody should understand that. And he says, and the day of death than the day of one's birth. Let me read that in the Amplified, see how it states it. A good, day, a good name is better than precious perfume, and the day of one's death better than the day of one's birth. Well, I would say that is, uh, that is true for uh, those people who are going to spend eternity in the kingdom of God, in the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, I have a, a study I did on the subject of heaven. The title is 50 Hours in Heaven. And I gave it that title because the study is actually 50 hours long. So it's really, it's probably the most comprehensive um, thorough, complete study on heaven that you'll find anywhere. Um, and as I studied heaven, I, I got very excited about my future. Um, in, et in eternity, obviously, the uh, what Jesus has waiting for me in eternity is, is so wonderful. It's, it's greater than words can describe. And uh, I know that uh, after I die, that's what I have to look forward to. So in that way, I would say, yeah, this is true for me. I hope it's true for you. I hope you uh, have at some point in your life called on the name of the Lord Jesus for your salvation. If you've ever put your faith in Jesus, if you've rejected religion as the answer, if you've rejected your personal performance, uh, doing good works as the answer, as the means uh, for salvation, if you've rejected that and instead uh, believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're depending on Jesus uh, for your salvation, you're trusting him to get you to heaven, then, uh, then you can make this same boast. You can boast in the Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. You, you've promised me eternal life in the kingdom of God. And so in that case, it would say, I could say this is true. And the day of death, then the day of one's birth. Uh, but this is not true for everyone. This is not true for many people. Uh, Brother Bill uh, had a hangout about a month ago, I think, uh, and it was a very interesting subject, and it was talking about the, uh, he started off by doing a little mathematical calculations just so we could estimate what percent of, uh, percentage of the world's population are saved, what, what percentage are what I would call biblical Christians who believe in the Christianity that's found in the Bible. What percentage are, uh, and it was really very, very small, just as Jesus said, uh, uh, why is the gate uh, broad as the road that leads to destruction? And many go that way. So Jesus said, many are going into destruction. Many will perish in the lake of fire. But he said, only a few go down the narrow road, the narrow way 
is Jesus Christ, trusting Jesus. So we know that most people will end up uh, perishing in the lake of fire, and a few people will have eternal life in the kingdom of God. And for the few, the 3%, then we can say this verse certainly is, is true for us. Uh, let me, quite a bit to discuss just in the very first verse here, but now to verse two, it is better to go to the house of mourning and that's mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. <clears throat> it is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Again, I want to look at this in the Amplified. <clears throat> it says, it is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that day of death is the end of every man, and the, the living will take it to heart and solemnly ponder its meaning. Uh, yesterday, I joined uh, Brother Bill Cuthbert's uh, hangout, um, and the, the subject, the theme of the hangout was uh, testimonies. And I think there were five of us on the panel that gave our testimony testimony about how we got saved <clears throat> um, and the, uh, the 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 theme kind of the uh, the one of the things that we got out of that is that uh, uh, or at least that I expressed in my testimony is that it took a monumental event in my life for me to ponder as it says here, and the living and the living will take it to heart and solemnly ponder its meaning. Well, let me read the entire verse two again. It is better to go to the house of mourning. That's that's just someone who's mourning a death, a funeral, than to go to the house of feasting. For that day of death is the end of every man, and the living will take it to heart and solemnly ponder its meaning. This is exactly the experience that I had that I expressed in my testimony yesterday that uh, it was the death of my mother that made me ponder what is the purpose of life? What happens after we die? And that, of course, inspired me to look for the answers in the Bible. And this is where I got the answers. This is where I found the truth. Uh, so, again, in that respect, rather than going to a feast and having a big party, it's really better for most people to go to a funeral and where there's mourning. It's, it's sad, but it may make you wonder and ask yourself these deep, important questions. What happens after we die? What is the purpose of life? And I hope if you're seeking, if you reach the point where you want answers to those questions, you'll go to the Bible and that's where you'll get the truth. Now, verse 3 in the KJV says, uh, Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. Hmm. How is it made better? Let me read verse 3 in the Amplified, it says, sorrow is better than laughter, for when a face is sad, deep in thought, the heart may be happy because it's growing in wisdom. Uh, sometimes it's this very sad event or sad situation in one's life that uh, we learn the most. Uh, obviously, none of us are going to seek out and make a plan. I want to be sad today so that I can learn something. But when those days come upon us, that that is what can be gained from these sad experiences. Wisdom, understanding, in my case, salvation. Verse 4 in the KJV says, The heart of the wise 
is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. So this is more of the same, saying that uh, the wise person learns a lot and gains a lot from these, uh, um, from mourning, from from funerals, from uh, sad uh, occurrences in our lives. Verse five, it is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the songs of fools. Uh, for as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. This also is vanity. Let me read verse six in the Amplified. For like the crackling of burning thorn bushes under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. And this too is vanity, futility. The fool. This is, a, you know, King Solomon wrote, this book, Ecclesiastes. Uh, King Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs. I recently completed a, a study on the book of Proverbs, 31 chapters. It took 10 months. Uh, I, that that uh, series is also available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. But it is, of course, can, since King Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs and the book of Ecclesiastes, there are some obvious similarities in that uh, in, in Proverbs, there's a recurring theme comparing the wise person against the fool. Um, if, if you do these things in your life, it's wise. If you do these things, it's foolish. If you're wise, you're going to get uh, blessings in your life. You're going to have good results. You'll be successful in every way. If you're foolish and you do foolish things, you're going to have bad consequences come into your life. Uh, well, now we, we also see in the book of Ecclesiastes, this same um, style, the same theme, where he's comparing the wise against the foolish. And so he says that uh, 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 the laugh, he talks about the laughter of, of the fool. This is also vanity. Vanity just means that it's meaningless. It's pointless. There's nothing to be gained from it. And in the earlier chapters of Ecclesiastes, uh, particularly chapter 1, chapter 2, he's talking about all these things in his life that were, were, you would think would be great successes, um, great wealth, great fame, great wisdom. Uh, and, and yet his con conclusion is... Uh, all of these things turn out to be vanity. That means meaningless and pointless. The the only thing that really gave him satisfaction that filled this hole in his heart. You've heard there's this expression is you have a God-shaped hole in your heart and only Jesus can fill it. Well, there's something missing with Solomon and uh, success couldn't fill that void. Um, fame wealth none of these things could fill that void and, and give him satisfaction it was all meaningless uh oh he only got this contentment this satisfaction by uh, by his relationship with god uh, let's verse seven in the kjv says surely oppression maketh a man wise <clears throat> i'm sorry let me read that again surely oppression maketh a wise man mad and a gift destroyeth his heart so uh, even a wise man if if they're oppressed enough they will go mad go crazy uh, this is mad is uh, meaning uh, insane rather than angry and a gift destroyeth the heart hmm I'm not sure what that means, but let's look at verse 7 in the, in the Amplified. It says, for oppression makes a wise man foolish, and a bribe corrupts the good judgment of the heart. Yeah, I found this also the case uh, over and over again uh, in the book of Proverbs, that when Solomon used the word gift, Oftentimes, it really was referring to a bribe. Someone gives you a gift, uh, a bribe, in order to uh, get some kind of 
maybe political favor. Um, verse 8 in the KJV says, Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Uh, better is the end of a thing. Hmm. In the Amplified, it phrases it this way. The end of a matter is better than its beginning. Patience of spirit is better than the haughtiness of spirit or pride. The end of a matter is better than its beginning. Well, I guess if you if you're you have a matter, you have a subject, you have a problem, and, and you're you you set out to solve the problem to uh, accomplish something. In the beginning, uh, it seems like it's it maybe the the answer the the good resolution is is far away and and then as you finally get it accomplished then it, it turns out it's better because it's you've accomplished something rather the beginning is just a a hope a plan a goal uh, what i found though is that uh sometimes even after you've succeeded in, uh you're, you've accomplished your goal, but there's kind of a, a an, an emptiness there too, a, a vanity in that, uh, okay, good. I thought I, I was really excited about this. And now that I've accomplished it, uh, it I'm, I'm not as satisfied as I expected to be. This is the kind of experience that Solomon had and he, he's writing about in this book. Um, Verse 9 in the KJV says, Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Yeah. I mean, there is a time and place for anger. Uh, the term righteous indignation, to be indignant, to be angry, upset. Uh, sometimes it is, it is righteous. It is the right thing to do. Even Jesus got angry and expressed his anger uh, against the people that were um, making a mockery of the temple by just using it for for financial gain. He he got uh, angry with the Pharisees who were so full of spiritual pride and self righteousness. And uh, um, so th sometimes it is appropriate to be angry. Uh, but you shouldn't be hasty to be angry. Anger should not be something that we're quick. Uh, scriptures also tell, tell us that be uh, uh, quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Verse 10 says, Say not thou, what is the cause that the former days were better than these? For thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. What is the cause that the former days were better than these? And why was uh, the, why were the days in past the good old days? Let me see how it says it in the Amplified. Do not say, quote, why were the old days better than these, unquote. For it is not. Uh, for it is not from wisdom that thou you sh that that you sh that you ask about this. I guess it's saying, don't reflect on just the good old days and why was it better. Verse eleven in the KJV says, "Wisdom is good and good with an inheritance, and by it there is profit to them that see the sun." Wisdom is good with an inheritance. Well, I guess it's talking about if you have an inheritance and you're, and you're wise, it's a good thing. Possibly if you have an inheritance, but you're a foolish person, and uh, the inheritance might not be such a good thing after all. <clears throat> and by it, there is profit to them that see the sun. I have no idea what that means. Uh, let's read it in the Amplified. Wisdom along with an inheritance is good and an excellent advantage for those who see the sun. 
I still don't know what it means. So in other words, if you have, if you're have an inheritance and you're wise, uh, the wisdom means you are greatly advantaged uh, rather than someone who gets an inheritance and is foolish and pay, may possibly and likely just waste away the inheritance. Verse 12 in the, in the uh, KJV says, for wisdom is a defense and money is a defense, but the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life to them that have it. Hmm. See what, how it's phrased in the Amplified. For wisdom is a protection, even as money is a protection. But the excellent advantage of knowledge is that wisdom shields and preserves the lives of its possessors. Verse 13 in the KJV says, Consider the work of God, for who can make that straight, which he hath made crooked? Mm -hmm. Well, you're not going to be able to change God's will. Uh, verse 14, In the day of prosperity be joyful, but in the day of adversity consider. God also hath set the one over against the other to the end that man should find nothing after him. In the Amplified, it phrases it this way. In the day of prosperity, be joyful. But in the day of adversity, consider that God has made the one as well as the other. So this is, uh, a person could take this, that God is, is um, um, in control, that uh, God is sovereign and he, he makes these things happen. Of course, a person could take that principle to such an extreme that you get Calvinism and Calvinism is uh, uh, one of the most evil philo philosophies ever invented by man because it means it teaches that God controls every single thing and it, it, even every sinful thing we do, God is making us do it. He's controlling it. And therefore, man becomes the innocent party and God is the guilty party. God is the sinner because he's making man do the sins. And that's evil. That's not true. That's against the character and nature of God. So you can take even a, a, a good idea, a, prin, a basic principle that's true, and, and you, uh, you uh, do it uh, hyper or ultra, uh, ultra uh, like uh, you, you go to such an extreme, like uh, uh, hyper extending my elbow. My elbow is designed to go so far. If I extend it farther than that, I've hyperextended and I've broken it, I've damaged it. It's the same thing if you take any idea to such an extreme, you've changed it from a good thing into a bad thing. Uh, verse uh, 15 in the KJV says, All things have I seen in the days of my vanity. Uh, there is a just man that perisheth in his righteousness. And there is a wicked man that prolongeth his life in his wickedness. So, so Solomon has seen all of these things, even things that seem to be unfair. Why, why do bad things happen to good people? Uh, read, I mean, if you haven't seen my study on the book of Job, I completed that recently. And one of the things you learn in the book of Job is that uh, it's true. It's, uh, some people think that uh, the principle of reaping and sowing uh, is 100% uh, effective on mankind. That it is, it is not just a principle, but it's a law that a person always gets what they deserve. You always will reap what you sow. But it is a principle, and it is true many times, but it's not always true. Sometimes a person sows well and reaps badly, like Job. Uh, this is truly a righteous man that had horrible things happen to him. It wasn't because 
he was reaping what he sowed. Uh, he was uh, the best example of, of uh, bad things happening to a good person. So you should not, uh, don't conclude that every time something bad happens to someone, that it's, it's what they deserve. Um, let me see. Uh, verse 16 says, Be not righteous over much, neither make thyself over wise. Why shouldest thou destroy thyself? <clears throat> and it's phrased in the, in the uh, Amplified this way. Do not be excessively righteous like those given to self-conceit. <clears throat> and do not be overly wise. That's pretentious. Why should you bring yourself to ruin? Um, well, these are the extremely religious people who are all puffed up with spiritual pride. And again, I said, I said earlier that uh, Jesus, he didn't get angry uh, as a rule, but he got angry with the 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 proud, the the religious, the Pharisees. These are the people that uh, were so full of spiritual pride and self-righteousness, and that's what Jesus didn't like. He was kind and forgiving to the prostitutes, to the tax collectors, uh, and yet those people that thought they were really perfect, uh, that were, were always boasting about how good they are and condemning others, these are the people that made Jesus angry. Um, Verse 18 in the KJV is, It is good that thou shouldest take hold of this. Yea, also from this withdraw not thine hand. For he that feareth God shall come forth of them all. Now, feareth God, and you know, it's, it doesn't necessarily mean all the time that you're afraid of God's punishment. You're afraid, afraid of God's, uh, uh, you know, uh, reprimands or uh, uh, chastisement. Uh, fear could, it also means that it's a reverence and respect. Uh, revere God, res respect him, and also know that uh, God is God and you're not. And uh, you, you, you better better respect him because he has power to do whatever he will wants to do with you. In that respect, we should just be pro- uh, prostate thing god have mercy on me at all times but we always keep in mind that god is just god is loving and and merciful um verse um verse 19 says wisdom strengtheneth the wise more than 10 mighty men which are in the city. For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Well, this is one example of, of many we find in the scriptures that says that uh, no one's perfect. Everybody sins. And some people are so deluded and uh, they're deceiving themselves. The scripture even says, uh, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Everyone has sin. Everybody has sinned. Everybody continues to sin. Even if you make a vow and you, you strive and make a great effort to not sin, you cannot completely stop because uh, because that's our nature. Uh, so uh, there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Verse uh, twenty one says, also take no heed unto all words that are spoken, lest thou hear thy servant curse thee. Hmm. Let's look at that in the Amplified. It says, uh, 
Also, do not take seriously everything that is said so that you will not hear your servant cursing you. For you also know that you too have cursed others many times. Yeah. Verse 23 in the KJV says, All this have I proved by wisdom. I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. And this coming from Solomon, who most people uh, acknowledge as the wisest man who's ever lived, apart from that God-man, Jesus Christ, of course. Uh, Verse 24, that which is far off and exceeding deep, who can find it out? I, I applied mine heart to know in his search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. <clears throat> and I find more bitter than death uh, the woman whose heart is snares and nets and her hands are bands. Whoso pleaseth God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be taken by her. <clears throat> uh, let me read that in the Amplified. I have tested all this with wisdom. I said, I will be wise independently of God, <clears throat> but true wisdom is, was far from me. Whatever it has been is far off, deeply remote and exceedingly mysterious. Who can discover it? for it is beyond the grasp of man. I turned around and directed my heart to know, to investigate and to find uh, and to to seek skillful and godly wisdom and the reason for things. And to know that wickedness is folly and that foolishness is madness, leading to stupidity and recklessness. And I discovered that of all irrational sins, None has been so destructive in beguiling one away from God as Im, as immoral women. For bitter than death is the woman whose heart is composed of snares and nets and whose hands are chains. Whoso pleases God will escape from her, but the sinner will be taken captive of her evil. He talks about this a lot in the book of Proverbs also. This woman, this strange woman, and this seductress. And, um, I guess he must have had a real big problem uh, coping with this and uh, this temptation, the sexual temptation. He did have. I think he he had a thousand wives, and who knows how many concubines who are also his uh, sexual servants. Seemed like he really had a uh, had a sexual addiction, and so he, he he knows about this better than probably any of us. <clears throat> uh, verse twenty seven: Behold, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account which yet my soul seeketh, but I find not. One man among a thousand have I found, but a woman among all those have I not found. No, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. Well, good thing the chapter's ending because my voice is ending. Let me read this final verses in the Amplified and see how it's expressed. Behold, I have discovered this, says the preacher. While adding one thing to another to find an explanation, which I am still seeking, but have not found, I have found one man among a thousand who pleases God but I have not found such a woman among all these, a thousand in my harem. 
Behold, I have found only this as a reason. God made man upright and uncorrupted, but they, they, both men and women, have sought out many devices for evil. Well, he certainly, uh, he recognized that uh, mankind is uh, innately uh, a sinner. We don't have to be taught to be, be sinners. Uh, after we're born, um, it doesn't take long at all for an infant to begin to be defiant and lying and selfish. Uh, it's part of our who we are. I bet he's even more, <laughs> more uh, judgmental against women, thinking that in, in, with men, it's one out of a thousand that's good. And with women, there's zero. He's quite cynical and bitter because look at a thousand women in his harem and he doesn't think any of them are any good. Well, those are the writings of Solomon and uh, the, based on his experiences, that's the end of this chapter, um, chapter seven of Ecclesiastes. Uh, next time we'll, we'll do chapter eight. But first, before I close this broadcast, I'd like to take a couple of minutes to tell you something really positive because in some ways this chapter here is quite negative, could be quite depressing. And so I think you should be happy to hear some good news here at the end. Uh, in fact, the word gospel is a Greek word that literally means good news. Um, but the way I see it, uh, the word really should be translated to great news. Even the greatest news ever. That's what I'm going to share with you right now. So brace yourself. This will be the best news you've ever heard. And that is that uh, salvation, eternal life in heaven, eternal life in the kingdom of God in the new heavens and the new earth with joy and bliss and happiness forever. This is offered to everyone as a free gift from Jesus Christ. That's what Christianity is. Christianity is that Jesus Christ uh, offers all of us Salvation is a free gift. Now, not everybody gets it because they won't accept it. Most people either don't understand this or they will not accept it as truth. Most people think that in order to go to heaven, it will be decided based upon personal merit. Most people think that the good people get to go to heaven the not so good people, particularly the really bad people, they don't go to heaven, they go to hell. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that everyone is a sinner. Heaven it will be full of sinners. Hell is full of sinners. What's the difference? The people in heaven trusted Jesus for their salvation. The people in hell didn't believe that Jesus is the one and only way. Instead, they tried to get to heaven some other way. Even while well, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh to the Father, but by me. So Jesus said, not only that he's the, the way to heaven, the way to heaven regarding Jesus uh, just simply means that uh, he's the door you go through. He's the gate. Uh, he, he's the means of salvation and you need to depend on him to do it for you. Uh, but he emphasized and said, not only am I saying I'm the way, I'm saying the, I'm the one and only way, no exceptions. So in that we can infer that uh, Buddha is not the way. Muhammad's not the way. 
the Pope is not the way, the Virgin Mary is not the way, and personal merit, uh, getting to heaven through your own efforts, your own achievement, that's not the way. The one and only way is Jesus Christ. And the good news is that uh, he's not telling you, you've got to work real hard and be perfect to, to get it. He's saying it's impossible for you to be perfect. For that reason, I'll do the work for you. He lived a perfect, sinless life. We could never do that. We fall short. We all sin. Uh, the, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Well, Jesus suffered and died on a cross to pay our penalty. He, he died right so that we wouldn't have to. Now, we will die and then be resurrected and be judged. But those of us who trust Jesus will not die the second death. The Bible says the second death is in the lake of fire where man, the lost people perish. So Jesus, he, he died for our sins. He, and he uh, was buried and he raised himself back to life on the third day. Now he didn't raise himself back to life um, for, for any other reason except as a sign. The Jews demanded a sign from Jesus. He claimed to be God. He claimed to be the Savior. He claimed to be the one and only way to God. And they wanted to kill him because of his claims. And they said, prove it then. If you're who you, this is true. All these claims, prove it. Give us a sign. He said, the sign I'll give you is the sign of Jonah. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. He was speaking about his death, burial, and resurrection. So he died on the cross and paid for our sins. He was buried. He was in the tomb for three days. And then on the third day, he was raised back to life bodily. It was not just a spirit coming out of the tomb. It was his body, a bodily resurrection. And this is the sign he promised us. This is the sign that he delivered for us as proof that his claims were true. And the scriptures tell us that um, he walked bodily for 40 days among 500 witnesses. And they saw him. They talked to him. They touched him, they ate with him, and the bodily resurrection is the proof that Jesus gave us that he is God, he is the Savior, he alone has power over life and death, and he offers us life everlasting as a free gift if we'll just trust him. Now, Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light to be yoked to Jesus, to be joined to him. And he says, uh, I hold you in the palm of my hand. So Jesus grabs a hold of you and you in faith trust him. And he says, no one can pluck you out. So once you put your faith in Jesus, he has a hold of you and no one can break that hold. Even if you get do bad things, you, if you get into sin and your sin does not prevent him from holding on to you. Even if you get uh, a lack of faith in your life, you don't have faith, but he remains faithful. The Bible says he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. So once you put your faith in Jesus, you're guaranteed you're going to go to heaven no matter what, because your salvation is irreversible it's irrevocable by god or by man so that's why um, uh, someone who understands biblical christianity can be happy every day because we are guaranteed we're going to go to heaven and that gives us peace like a river joy like a fountain thank you for watching and i, I hope you will join me for these uh, live broadcasts 
I try to do them daily. And next time in Ecclesiastes, we'll, we'll look at uh, chapter 8. Uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.